All right, I think that we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the March edition of Show and Tell presented by our team here at FS. I'm Nico Gavino. I'm a strategist for the Culture and Consumer Insights team, and I'm going to be your host today. So if this is your first time joining Show and Tell, this is actually a monthly webinar that we do with our global team, where we share what's currently inspiring us, things that are on our radar. And it's really just a very free flowing exchange of ideas from all parts of culture. For us as a team, we use a lot of these meetings to start gathering intel for future forecasts and macro trends. And just as a reminder, you know, we will be sharing today's presentation and a document of all the links that we shared with you today later this week. We do love to hear from you during the webinar, so feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions or to just let us know what you're loving. So you want to make sure that your chat box pull down has everyone selected so that both participants and our team members can see uh, what you're loving. And next, I'm just going to hand it over to Ashley quickly to talk about some upcoming events. Thank you, Nico. Hi, everyone. Um, as Nico mentioned earlier, we've been running our um, Future of a Webinar series that kicked off on Monday, uh, but we still have some more events happening for the rest of the week. So if you are available to join us tomorrow and Friday, we have some great events. We have the Future of Retail, which is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And on Friday, we have the Future of Active, which is at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. They're free to attend uh, and you can find out more details by registering at fashionsnoops.com forward slash events. Um, and if you missed any of the webinars that we hosted um, earlier this week, we ran the future of home and lifestyle, the future of wellness and the future of materials, which was today. We will be, uh, we have recorded them and we'll be making them available um, to you in the coming days. So not to worry. Uh, and then on the 15th of March, we are running our live um, webinar, which is Full Winter 23-24 Women's Runway uh, Wrap-Up Webinar. So um, please do join us for that. You can also register at fashionsnoops.com forward slash events. And that's all from me today. Thanks, Nico. Thank you, Ashley. So everyone, just give me one second to get our links up for this webinar. Great. Right. All right, so I'm actually up first, and my first link today is a book that I actually just finished last night, and I did just buy it on Saturday, but don't be too impressed. It's a super, super short read. It's the kind of book that you could read in one day. Um, I got it at my favorite bookstore, which is Spoonbill and Sugartown in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and it's a book that I've had my eye on for a while, and it's finally on paperback, so right when I saw that paperback copy, I went ahead and got it, but anyway, uh, The Employees is a science fiction novel, but it's in sort of an unusual structure in that it's simply a series of staff reports and memos. Now, I'm just going to read you the summary on the back of the book because I think it definitely summarizes it way better than I possibly could. So shortlisted for the International Booker Prize, the employees reshuffles a sci-fi voyage into a riotously original existential nightmare. Aboard the interstellar ship uh, called the 6,000 ship, the human and humanoid crew members complain about their daily tasks in a series of staff reports and memos. When the ship takes on a number of strange objects from the planet New Discovery, the crew becomes deeply, deeply attached to them, even as tensions boil toward mutiny, especially among the humanoid crew. Mm -hmm. So in chilling, crackling, and exhilarating prose, the employees probes into what makes us human while delivering a hilariously stinging critique of life governed by the logic of productivity. So what's really captured me about this was, of course, first this cover, which is on the hardback, really beautifully designed. But when I read the summary, I knew that this was something that I would really be interested in. I love anything that approaches sci-fi, aliens, and technology in a really interesting and fresh way. And what I think is really interesting about this novel in particular is that as a society, we're asking a lot of the same questions that this novel is asking as AI is rapidly advancing. So those are questions like, you know, 
um, what does it mean to be human? And uh, where do we draw the line between what is intelligent and what's not? And the author, Olga Raven, was asking these questions before this whole AI craze even kind of exploded in the last year. And I really love that the book probes into the inner thoughts of these half tech, half flesh humanoids about their existential questions about their existence and the meaning of their existence. Something that I actually just discovered last night was that the book was actually written originally as simply an accompaniment to this installation by another artist. I believe her name is Lea Goldit Hestelund. And it was these objects which were suspended from ropes and also laid on the ground. Essentially, Olga Raven wrote a story to accompany this installation. And initially it was just a pamphlet that was left on the floor around the exhibition and they ended up publishing it as a book a year later so I loved seeing these pictures of the actual objects which are taken on from the new planet into the spaceship in the book and seeing a visualization of them I was like yes this is exactly what I was thinking but anyway I thought that that was just a cool fact about the book my second link is actually a little bit related as we talked about AI a little bit um, it's something that I've been enjoying quite a lot lately, and it's these AI song covers that people are making from home. And the creators of these AI song covers essentially train AI models on the voices of famous singers like Beyonce and Ariana Grande and Lady Gaga. And they transform existing songs using the data, which is their voices. So it's pretty amazing, but it's obviously something that is going to have to be regulated in the near future. You know, your voice is essentially your intellectual property. It's also something that is a little bit scary and creepy, but in a way it's also interesting and beautiful. And I think it's okay for all of those feelings to kind of coexist at the same time as we figure out the ethics and the applications of AI. So I'm not gonna hold you from hearing this any longer. If you've attended our show and tells before, you'll know that I'm a big Lady Gaga fan. So I'm gonna show you some of these Lady Gaga AI covers. Also, before I do that, uh, let me make sure that I'm sharing the speak the audio. We can hear it, Nico, so. You can hear it well? Okay. Yeah, try it and I'll tell you if we can. No. That's your destiny. So if you don't know, that's a song by ABBA, The Winner Takes It All. Um, if you're familiar with Lady Gaga's voice, you'll notice that this is extremely clear and it's eerily similar to, you know, a realistic vocal done by herself. I do want to show another example. I don't know if any of you are Lana Del Rey fans, but this one is Lady Gaga singing video, game, video games by Lana Del Rey. Swinging in the backyard, pull up in your fast car, whistling my name. Open up a beer, and you say get over here and play a video game. I'm in a spare sundress, watching me get undressed, treat that body downtown. I say you the bestest, ain't no full big kiss, put a spare perfume on, go play a video game. It's you, it's you, it's all for you, everything I do, it 
So I'll stop it there. Um, if you want to see more of these, there's a lot of different accounts for different artists. This one is LadyGaga.ai on TikTok. Um, like I said, you know, this is something that's obviously going to be probably more regulated in the future. But I think it's interesting to imagine, you know, as an artist, you know, you could essentially license out your voice either to like your estate after you pass, and they could continue creating music with your voice or even while you're alive, just using an AI model trained on your voice to release your own music would be really interesting. So my second link is a big turn. It's definitely very different. Um, or sorry, my third link, excuse me. Uh, this is a podcast episode from my favorite podcast, The Ezra Klein Show by The New York Times. And what I love about Ezra Klein is that he really has his finger on the pulse of the zeitgeist. And the conversations that happen on his podcast are always either so prescient or just super relevant to what I'm thinking as a trend forecaster. And also what I think the conversations that we should turn our attention to as a culture. So in this episode, he speaks to Rachel Zoffness who is a pain psychologist from the University of California. And she's also the author of the Pain Management Workbook. And in this podcast, Rachel really emphasizes that pain is not a purely biomechanical phenomenon that is just rooted in the body, and that it's something that is also deeply rooted in our emotions and our environments, and also the social context that we're in. So at FS, this you know, integrative view of wellness is something that we have been really seeing grow in the mainstream. And it's informed even one of our 2025 macro trends, which is called mm -hmm. Sense Care. And this integrative view of wellness, you know, sees wellness as something that is not just looking at the brain and the body as separate entities, but really as highly interconnected systems. So one of the interesting insights that I got from this podcast was the psychologist's description or distinction rather between the concepts of harm and hurt, where hurt is essentially the feeling, the real feeling and the sensation of pain. Uh, so when I stub my toe and I feel pain, that's hurt. But harm is the actual damage to the body. So if I stub my toe and fracture it, or if I stub my toe and it starts to bruise or there's been tissue damage, that's harm. And the point that she makes is that hurt is not always accompanied by harm. And that's not to say that it's never accompanied by harm, but that oftentimes it's not. So she demonstrates this by sharing this story, which she calls the tale of two nails. So the first part of the story, she talks about a construction worker whose boot was pierced by a seven inch nail all the way through after jumping down from part of the site. And his colleagues came to him. He was panicking in agonizing pain. And when he goes to the hospital and they inspect it, they found that the nail had actually gone between his toes, but, and there was no damage to his foot at all. But the visual of the nail going through his boot and the reaction of his coworkers elicited a real sensation of physical pain in him. So the second part of the story talks about a man who's, I'm not sure if he's a construction worker, but he's working with the nail gun that accidentally discharges. And he's hit in the face by the gun, but he's not pierced by any nails to his knowledge. So for the next few days, he starts to experience a toothache. And when he goes to the doctor, they find that a four inch nail is actually lodged behind his jaw. And because he had no idea that he had been pierced and that he didn't see the nail go in, he didn't feel as immense amount of pain. So those two stories just kind of illustrate the very um, large role that the brain plays in pain and also the difference between hurt and harm. 
So I highly recommend this podcast episode to anyone who's interested. I think it really connects again to our some of our macro trends like sense care and a lot of conversations that we're having in the beauty and wellness section. So check it out. And also any of the other episodes that he's done recently are also really cool. So my final link is a trailer that just came out last week. It's for an A24 film called uh, Past Lives. As many of you know, A24 is always coming out with the most popular and culture shifting movies of the year for the last few years. Uh, I've heard that this one is really already highly acclaimed. It was um, a big hit at the Sundance Film Festival 2023. So I'm gonna let you guys Take a look. There's a word in Korean, inyon. It means providence or fate. Do you believe in that? That's just something Koreans say to seduce a man. What a good story this is. Childhood sweethearts who reconnect 20 years later and realize they were meant for each other. In the story, I would be the evil white American husband standing in the way of destiny. Shut up. There's just this kid in my head for such a long time. I think I just missed him. Did he miss you? Hands off! Wow, Dota. Wow. 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 If two strangers walk by each other in the street and their clothes accidentally brush, it means there have been 8,000 layers of inyan between them. Want you to stay. Want you to stay. Uh, I love this trailer. I feel like it really captures the kind of longing that is such a universal feeling, a uh, universal emotion. Um, of course, we've seen so many themes uh, coming out of South Korea and of course the cinema that's been coming out of South Korea has been so popular in the last few years with the growth of Hallyu, the Korean wave. And I love films like this that are really kind of about that push and pull between cultures and the, you know, people who come from the diaspora, you know, longing for lives that they had back home. I think it's a relatable experience for a lot of immigrants uh, and love to see that kind of hybrid culture brought to life in these stories. So the release date for that hasn't actually been announced yet. It's quite a new trailer, but it's definitely something that I'm going to be seeing in theaters when it comes out. So up next, we have Aurora from the Home and Lifestyle team. Hey, Aurora. Hey Nico, thank you for sharing all of that good stuff. The voices are freaking me out, man. Um, but totally flipping the switch right now. Today, I wanted to take some time and start off sharing some resources to learn more about racialized experiences in design and architecture, you know, especially as Black History Month comes to a close in, uh, here in the US. Um, so for the first link, this is a really great article on Clever about interior race theory, 
which was sort of coined in response to the invention of critical race theory, which has been a large topic of conversation here in the United States recently. Um, and critical race theory works to examine race and socially constructed institutions that have perpetuated race-based oppression uh, on social, political, cultural, lingual, and even economic levels. A really good quote um, in the article is this example from Aaron Betsky, who wrote a piece for Architect Magazine about teaching architecture through a critical race theory lens. He writes, we cannot turn away from the fact that many of the structures we hold up as examples, like Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, were instruments of oppression and forced labor, that, and, even, uh, and that even what we think of as neutral models in whatever style were built to affirm wealth built on violence. What we also must recognize is that the forms we think of as good architecture, from the layout of our houses and offices to the white columns that festoon classical buildings, cement the culture of whiteness based on European models in stone, concrete, glass, wood, and steel. So it's kind of based off of this idea uh, and this new perspective of considering architecture. Last year, the creator of this term, Jacqueline Ogarshuku, uh, published an essay on the website for her brand called Making the Body a Home about this new concept that she describes as interior race theory. Basically, it's this idea that we can creatively resist oppressive structures within the home by challenging ourselves to think about the ways in which politics are embedded into our built environment and encouraging more of what she calls racial wellness within the spaces that we create and especially with regards to the objects that we curate. This idea also stemmed from Jacqueline's experiences as a black woman in spaces dominated by whiteness and in many instances where she found herself asking, you know, what would it look like to come back to a space that really felt safe? Um, and after reading Bell Hook's essay, Home Place, A Site of Resistance, which also kind of connects back to the idea of the homeland um, in, the, in the movie trailer that we just saw, Jacqueline started digging deeper into Hook's philosophies about creating intimate spaces that really help people deal with the hostility of racial oppress oppression. Um, Jacqueline explains in the article that, you know, in an ideal world, all spaces would function as places for restoration, remembrance, and resistance. One quote that really stood out to me, it's closer to the end, I'm sorry, I'm not really sure exactly where it is, um, but she does, she says what's really interesting about this theory is that it can be helpful for communities of color who are obviously experiencing racism and need spaces to restore themselves, but it could also be helpful for white or non-black people who benefit from racism and need spaces to unlearn that. So I think it's just really interesting that she has sort of developed this tool for considering racial equity in design. Um, and then my next. So good. <laughs> it's I was just say that um, it really reminds me of one of our micro trends from 2024, which we called decolonized by design, and really unpacking how our built environments and the clothes that we wear are impacted by you know oppressive systems and kind of trying to remove those and dismantle those things from our lives. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, and so the next link is connected to it. The so this one? Yeah, yeah, race and modern architecture. This is a pretty um, foundational text for learning more about design theory surrounding racialized experiences. Uh, the book shines a light on constructions of race and their impact on architecture and theory in Europe and North America, really since like the 18th century. Uh, so it really challenges us to write race back into architectural history, confronting how racial thinking has really intimately shaped a lot of key concepts surrounding modern architecture and culture over time. Um, so it's really interesting. And actually one of the authors of this book, uh, Charles L. Davis, also wrote another book for the MoMA's 2021 exhibition on Black Reconstruction in America, 
titled Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America. Both are really great resources if you do wanna dive deeper into this topic. Thank you so much for sharing those resources. And uh, finally, on a lighter note, this is just something that I have been super obsessed with. I guess somebody that I have been super obsessed with recently. Uh, GQ recently published this great article about him once it loads here. Um, Come on, Wi-Fi. Please hold for the tech. Um, but oh. his name, oh no, his name is Rajiv Surendra. I don't know if any of you recognize that, but he was in Gossip Girl, or not Gossip Girl, I'm sorry, Mean Girls. Um, I'll try to look it up. Sometimes the, the links act weird. Cool. Is it this one? Yes. Okay, let's hope it works. There we go. So <laughs> there's a pretty yeah. spicy image, but it's a great article sort of breaking down his rise to fame, his fall from fame. Um, and now he's a Renaissance man. So I think it's incredible. He's like out here on the internet showing us how to mend cane chairs and throw dinner parties and hand bind books. Recently, he went to the Met and was working with one of their archivists. Uh, looking at different textiles, and uh, I think it was Twill especially that he was looking at. Uh, he also does these really great thrift shopping tours. He used to live in Chicago, but now he lives in New York, and he's always on the lookout for the weirdest stuff, the most niche things, and I love watching them. Um, he's just like so pleasant. He really shows the process of everything. He's super approachable and knowledgeable. And if you're like a big history nerd, you know, he gets into all the nitty gritty details of like this finish came out in the 60s because of this societal thing that was going on. Uh, it's really fun. And just like a really great example of how younger people are turning into these Renaissance sort of types now that we have all of these new hobbies and we're really valuing a slower lifestyle. It even shows how people in urban environments can engage in some of these slow practices. Again, like he lives in New York. He tells you how you can make the most out of your small space and feng shui and uh, he has a YouTube channel, but he also makes videos with HGTV. And yeah, here are some just examples. We don't have to watch through all of them, but I did include them all just for fun. <laughs> I encourage you all to read aloud to the ones you love. A few months ago, I went to Paris with a couple of friends. We rented an apartment and uh, we spent almost every day outside painting. But in the evenings after dinner, we would go back to the apartment, we would light candles, and we started reading aloud to each other. It left me with a reminder of how special it is to spend quality time with the people that you love by actually doing something with them. Reading aloud, to your loved ones, reading aloud to people you care about is a classic, classic way of showing someone that you care about them or that you love them. It's also very, very romantic. Hi. You know what's so funny? I actually saw this video already. I think it was on TikTok. And I was like, I would love to do that. But I don't feel like any of my friends are really down to like sit in a circle and listen to me read but last night I was actually reading I was finishing the employees the book that I just showed everybody and I was reading it to my boyfriend because of this video I love that <gasps> yeah so many like you can just tell like his tone of voice it's so soothing if you're ever having like a bad day totally recommend just going to his YouTube channel and like binge watching everything he'll tell you how to stuff a mattress it's incredible <laughs> yeah um I don't know I'm sure most people here have seen Mean Girls he was Kevin G who is this math nerd and he loved to rap in the movie and he had a crush on Katie um so if that rings a bell that's him <laughs> all right thank you so much Aurora for sharing all those links uh next up we have Anush the director of accessories Hi, everyone. Thank you, Nico. Um, my first link is a, um, kind of a reemerging production by Pina Bausch, the German choreographer, called Aqua. And we've been talking so much about dance behind the scenes here at FS. 
And I wanted to just bring this in because it is playing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music this month. Um, if you want to scroll up, we can watch the um, kind of trailer for it. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. So I just loved how it was kind of channeling this tropical paradise. Um, and it reminded me of some of our seasonal narratives, Botanica, that we, we just put out a couple months ago and incorporates a lot of samba and bossa nova music. So we probably, as Navara said in the chat, um, there was a 2011 documentary by Wim Wenders that featured Pina. So that's probably how most people know her. So if you're in New York, definitely try to go see it. I think it will be really beautiful as many of her pieces are. Amazing. I think that's something that I have to see because one, I love Brazilian music. I love Bossa Nova, but also I've been trying to go more to these, um, you know, musical and like entertainment institutions here in New York City. So I think it'll be a really good opportunity to do that. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, my next link is Kong Cafe. And I just spent some time in Vietnam and learned about the incredible coffee culture and cafes there. And this particular cafe is a franchise within Vietnam. And I believe now they've expanded to the Philippines as well as Malaysia. And this was founded by a female Vietnamese entrepreneur named Nguyen Ha Lin. And it is this beautifully designed cafe that kind of takes the communist memorabilia of the war and really flips it on this head, head and makes it this kind of cool hipster setting. So I spoke to some people that were working there and some other younger Vietnamese people during my trip. And they're all very nostalgic for this kind of wartime things, but kind of creating it in their own way. So this place is decorated with war era paraphernalia, propaganda posters, all the staff wears fatigues. So it's really kind of this juxtaposition of the past and this nostalgic idea for this time that Gen Z didn't even live through. So it's a really interesting place to visit. And I, I really recommend if you're in Southeast Asia, look it up. I think they might be expanding to London. So it's just a really well done designed idea and the coffee is incredible. So just very cool and interesting and kind of takes this paraphernalia idea and really flips it on its head. It's such, I love the way that that's designed and I've been mm -hmm. seeing so much of these cafes and retail locations that really immerse visitors into a kind of story or a different era. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that. I think this aesthetic is, is really capture, captivating. Yeah. Um, my next link is a quiz to, um, you can find out how bittersweet you are. And this is something I shared with our team last week. And it's derived from the book by Susan Cain, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and longing make us whole. And bittersweet is this phenomenon of the place where joy and sorrow meet. It's a very human thing that we all feel. And especially in these kind of feelings of longing for different times, for nostalgia. And it also speaks to, you know, this kind of idea of we want things to be perfect or beautiful all the time, but we know that there's also a brokenness and there's an impermanence to everything. So I really loved this quiz. I encourage everyone to take it. You can find out how bittersweet you are. Um, and it's just really kind of insightful and interesting and kind of a new way to look at the world. Yeah. And you know what? This is like 
the exact kind of like theme that I think you can really feel like watching the trailer for for past lives is that like absolutely great nostalgia like this is it I did yeah. take the quiz when you shared it with us and <laughs> I don't remember what it categorized me as but I know that it was like the on the like most like bittersweet like sentimental side I forgot what they called it yeah yeah it's it's kind of interesting way to look at things and I'm sure many of us can relate being intuitive and sensitive people so take a take a take it when you can it's really interesting and then my last link is a musician who I think embodies the sense of bittersweetness and longing in his music. He, his name is Tamino and he's a Belgian, Egyptian, Lebanese mu musician, and he's living in Belgium. And he's the grandson of this really famous Egyptian singer and actor from the 1960s, Moharam Faoud. And Tamino's music takes these elements of classic elements of Middle Eastern music. And the scale of Middle Eastern music is very kind of has this feeling of sadness and bittersweet when it's played. And he kind of takes that and works it into sort of singer songwriter, a singer songwriter style that's probably derived from like Jeff Buckley or Chris Cornell. So it's really emotive and moving and I just think he's amazing and, you know, he's making some really interesting videos and he's also a muse of Anne de Mulemeester and Dries Van Noten. So okay. I, there's a one video at the bottom, I think, if you want to just play a couple minutes, I kind of like this kind of dystopian vibe of the video and you can get a little taste of his music. All right. The first disciple. Yep. Okay. Let's do it. vocals are so beautifully mixed yeah he's really a special musician and I think he's touring so definitely look him up if you're interested so yeah, thank you that's all from me thank you everyone thank you so much Anush <laughs> next we have a new member Hannah from our intimates and swim team hey Hannah Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Hannah. I've recently been with the FS team for a few months now. So super excited to be sharing with everyone today and hearing everyone's ideas in this show and tell. Um, I'm the senior strategist for the Intimates and Swim Market. Um, so the first link I have that I wanted to share with you is um, a show from Paris Fashion Week. Um, so as we know, that's Paris Fashion Week this week. And this design and real edge had a light show on for their presentations. So they use these UV lights to kind of uncover these heat reactive um, outfits where underneath they initially looked plain, solid colors, and then these uh, patterns are revealed. So if you scroll along, I think there might be a few more examples too. 
Um, but the idea around behind the collection was really inspired by the theory of unwelt, um, which I looked into because I wanted to learn more about this. And it's about um, really that our perception of our environment is really defined by our capacity to perceive. So making the point that things are not really necessarily what they seem to be, which I thought was super interesting. That's amazing. I love to see so many of these new like kind of tech innovations happening on the runway, like we saw with Kaparni and that sprayable dress. I think this is another great example of that kind of incorporation. Exactly. It kind of makes it feel almost a little bit more theatrical um, yeah. in the moment, more experiential. And then my second link here is um, about Jacquemus obsessions. So they've been teasing recently on their Instagram handle. Um, and they revealed yesterday that they're opening today at Galleries Lafayette, um, a pop-up or more of a store takeover. Um, so if you don't know, Galleries Lafayette is a beautiful department store in the center of Paris. And um, they're displaying 16 windows across the store. Um, they're gonna have three boutiques within the department store as well. Um, and also a coffee and flower shop too, which is, looks super cute. Um, so this collaboration is on display from now until April 2nd. And if you're in the Paris area, I'd definitely go check it out. Amazing. Jacques Mousse is like the king of retail concepts right now. And we used one of um, his pop-ups in our future retail report. Just, you know, these sensory experiences that are immersive, multi-purpose, always does an amazing job at that. And then my um, last link is just really a fun one. It's a fun idea that I'm seeing popping up globally. Um, but this video is from a market stool in London. Um, if you want to turn the sound on, I can pause for a moment. Yeah, sure. It's great for avid readers. You basically just pick a book based on the bullet points that are provided on the paper. Basically, all you have to go is a couple of bullet points that detail whether it's a love story, whether it's set in wartime, whether it's futuristic, and you don't get to find out what the book is until you open it. It's a really, really great way of trying something new. It's pretty much like Christmas for book lovers. We absolutely loved it. 10 out of 10 would do again. So when I saw this, I just thought it was such a fun idea. And, and like I said, you know, this is a video from London that I saw on Instagram. And then I was in my local bookstore at the weekend and they had a front table um, with a similar idea. And I just like the simplicity of it, uh, you know, in a world where we're just constantly bombarded with imagery and like so much information. Um, I just love that, you know, kind of pairing it back a little bit. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's literally the idea of don't judge a book by its cover, which is a fun, fun take. So true. And that one person got a rival and I'm jealous. I want to read that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. All right. So next up, we have Charlotte from our accessories team. Hey, Charlotte. Hi, Nico. Thank you. It's my first time sharing a show and tell, so I'm very excited. The first link I wanna share with you is an article from Ignan on a photo series. Um, it's actually from 2021, but the Ignan article was just published and kind of put it on my radar. Um, but the series was documented by Ken Codell, who's a Shanghai-based photographer. Um, and the series is titled Dial Thok, which translates to mutual connection or common thread in Tibetan. So the images transport you to a remote village of Ritoma in Tibet. Uh, which is mostly populated by a tight-knit community of craftswomen who work for a local uh, textile atelier. And for centuries, these people have sort of lived in harmony with the environment. They've utilized it to meet their basic needs without exploiting it and have maintained this like really beautiful relationship between the earth and the animals and the people. Um, but economic and political shifts in China, as well as climate change, of course, has put a strain on this relationship. Um, so for the past few years, the community has been trying to return to their traditions amid our rapidly changing world. And part of that was welcoming in this photographer uh, to learn and to document. Um, and at first, not super warmly, but eventually this really beautiful bond was formed. And I really think it resonates through these images. Um, it just feels so intimate and endearing. Uh, and to quote from the final paragraph of the article, 
Uh, Dao Thok is a tender portrait of the remote communities of Tibet and their daily lives between tradition and an ever-changing world. It's a series that gives us a glimpse into that way of life that at first seems very different from the hectic reality of modern society. But looking closely, however, allows us to feel and explore how we are all profoundly connected to, to each other. Um, so just a really amazing series and a beautifully written article. So I would definitely recommend reading it in full and exploring um, the whole series that's on Kin's website, uh, which is linked in the article. I love this image. This is probably my favorite. Yeah, so beautiful. And then the second link that I want to share is along the same vein as Dial Thok. Um, see if it'll load. It's kind of a big link. <laughs> There we go. Um, so yeah, it came out at the end of 2022 and it's this beautiful digital zine uh, published by fashion designer Lucanio Wadingi titled The Provenance. Um, and to quote that second page, it says the provenance is exactly that, a warm and heartfelt welcome by Lucanio Wadingi into the intimate nexus upon which his eponymous label has been built since 2015. Um, so it features some archival pieces, drawings, process work and just really beautiful collection, or sorry, really beautiful photography of all of his different collections. Um, and it also highlights the community of female artisans um, in Burkina Faso in West Africa, um, who handcraft all of the textiles that go into each collection from start to finish, the weaving, the dyeing, all of it. Um, and there's also a really beautiful short film on the brand's YouTube uh, titled Burkina, which was shot to highlight all of that. Um, it came out last year and we've referenced it in a past report. Um, it's so beautiful and a really insightful look into the whole process. Um, but I love how this scene sort of walks you through the start of the brand um, into where they are now, just sort of like radiates with gratitude and gives you a new perspective, um, whether you know the brand or not. Um, but yeah, I would highly recommend diving into this some more, um, as well as their other content like on their YouTube or Instagram. Uh, it's super inspiring. It's always really visually beautiful. And just a really great example of a label showcasing the artisans behind their product and not just their skills, but their whole kind of way of life and the communities that they've built. I'm um, sort of in the same way that Dial Thok, the photo series did, um, really honing in on what kind of connects us all. Wow. Yeah, this is beautiful. And I think it's so mm -hmm. smart and such a great thing when brands come out with print material, which I feel like, you know, at the end of the catalog era, a lot of brands stop doing. But I always think it's such a great way to educate your customer on like the backstory of your brand and your collection and giving them a kind of tactile piece to the brand that's not just your product, but also tells your story. And of course, I feel like this trend is growing of kind of putting the people in the back at the front, you know, of yeah, your brand. And this is like a great example of that. Yeah, it's super important and hoping to see more of that in the future. So you thank you, Nika. Thank you, everyone. So finally, we have Melissa Moylan, VP of Women's Wear, showing us a couple links. Hi, Nico. Hi, everyone. Um, good to be here today. So the first share that I have, you may have seen it on TikTok. It's kind of recirculated lately, and it is an installation that was up from 2016 to 2019 at the Guggenheim in New York. It's called, it will load, it's called Can't Help Myself. Um, and it was meant to be a commentary on contemporary life. The artists behind it were Sun Yun and Peng Yu. Um, and it's basically this industrial robot arm that you see in this glass box. Um, it contains this pool of liquid seeping out that is not blood, but looks like it. And over time, the robot arm actually slowed down. Um, we could watch, I'll kind of, I'll talk through it and then we could watch that one. And then there's another one that's really good because people are setting it to music on TikTok. So that's kind of why we're seeing this resurgence of this installation, even though it's not current. Um, basically what happened to the arm is that it ran out of hydraulic fluid in 2019. So people have all kinds of theories on it. Um, the arm is basically continuously cleaning up as pieces of you fall apart. So a lot of people are connecting this to mental health. 
Um, and then if you go back to the doc, the second link that I have to share, um, we could watch that because it's set to music. And I'll just let that play for a minute. Yeah, today, today, we escape. We So I thought that was kind of beautiful. And I'm just going to read a little bit of what that um, that account on Instagram had said. Um, he said, no piece of art has ever emotionally affected me the way this robot arm piece has. It's programmed to try to contain the hydraulic fluid that's con constantly leaking out and required to keep itself running. If too much escapes, it will die. So it's desperately trying to pull it back to continue to fight for another day. Um, and I just thought it was, so, and it continues to go, I'm not, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it just continues to go on. And it's such a beautiful, I think, poetic commentary and interpretation of the piece. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that the Guggenheim commented because so many people have been posting this recently on TikTok. And Guggenheim said that it was actually meant to address contemporary issues surrounding migration on sovereignty. Um, so that's something that, you know, I thought it was a beautiful interpretation because art is always up to the eye of the beholder, right? We could interpret things maybe in a different way that they were originally intended. And I thought that the commentary and kind of connection to kind of human life and mental health was really interesting, um, you know, and channeling that through something that's super industrial. Wow, yeah. So I feel like I never viewed it in that way. And I've seen this piece a lot and it makes it a lot more emotional and touching. Essentially just trying to like stop something that's inevitably going to happen and they just like keep trying. It's actually sad. Exactly. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. But now on a bit of a happier or maybe more um positive outlook, there's another documentary. We have so many great films today to look into. This one's called Fashion Reimagined. And it's a documentary that's been making its rounds at the film festivals and it's being released on March 3rd, I believe in the UK and Ireland. Um, and it follows the founder and creative director of Mother of Pearl, Amy Powney. Um, and it follows her through her first sustainable collection, which is from field to finish garment. She launched her collection in 2018 called No Frills, which is entirely made of organic natural materials and also very socially and responsibly ethical. And today it's obviously several years since then, but her core collection built on these foundation of staple styles that are made as ethically as possible, which I think we continue to see um, a lot of designers bubbling up on Fashion Week this Fashion Month that are tapping into kind of wardrobe essentials and longevity of garments. So we could watch that trailer. I feel very separate from the fashion scene. I don't know, I never felt like a fit in. We all kind of sped up too fast in this generation. We produce a hundred billion items of clothing every year. More collections, more Three out of five of them end up in landfill. The chemicals, the quantity, the pollution, the carbon emissions. It's complete nonsense. I grew up in a caravan with no water, electricity or heating. And a lot of people that were involved in the fashion scene didn't grow up like that. It's like, it's a completely different world. Everything I've done is like a fight, every single step. My mission is to create a collection that's completely sustainable. It's organic, traceable, uses minimal chemicals, and it's produced in the smallest geographic region. Can we even do this? designers to turn up at the wool farm and say, I want to buy your wool. It doesn't work like that. The system doesn't work like that. And it's crazy. Is there a chance to make things better? I have faith, but I also have doubts in it. We have to grow, 
at the same time in the same direction. We need to reinvent the fashion industry. If people don't care about it too, perhaps my time in fashion will be over. Why is anyone letting them in? They're not ready. This is the path like I was supposed to be on. This is what I was always supposed to do. Are you there, Melissa? Yeah. Yeah, so it's definitely one I want to try and see whenever it launches in the States. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like a lot of fashion documentaries are always focusing on really big brands. Like, you know, we had Dior and I and stuff. And it's really refreshing to see a fashion documentary that's focused on a smaller label that has limited resources and is doing something that's actually, you know, revolutionary in a way. Definitely. I kind of, I kind of love that it focused on her at the start, which is now five years ago and kind of seeing how, you know, the challenges that she faced as a designer, kind of like buying the wool, as you saw, um, and to also see how it's being channeled today, five years later, and how she's kind of building it into her collections as a core, um, core wardrobing options. Thank you so much. Well, that concludes our March show and tell. And just want to say thanks to everyone for attending. We love sharing this virtual space with you all and engaging with you and our community. We will be sharing this recording on YouTube and the links later this week uh, for your reference. And don't forget to register for our April show and tell, which will take place on April 5th. And also don't forget that tomorrow, like Ashley mentioned, we do have our future of retail at, uh, I believe, 11 or 12 a.m or not 12, 11 or 12 p.m. And also our future of active, which will take place on Friday. Thank you so much, everybody.